And to me, this captures in a way, uh, rather funny manner, uh, the essence in a way of our current growth dilemma. Um, it is based on consumption, uh, the consuming of more and more goods, which of course requires more and more energy and more and more metabolic uh, interaction between the human economy and the non-human world, which, as I point out, but I think maybe doesn't need too much explanation to a, an audience like yourself, is simply ecologically unsustainable. And, and this is nothing new. Um, you know, the, the imagining, as I say here, of uh, an economy beyond growth uh, is something that well, you can trace back to, if you want to go back even further, to Aristotle uh, in his classical work on, on differentiating between primastistics, which he viewed as money making, and economia of the management of, of the household. But I've just given you a selection over the last couple of decades of uh, those who've been critical, this heterodox tradition that I would see uh, myself as a, as a proud member of. Um, you know, when you go back to Lewis the Growth, the classic in the 19, early 1970s, and Aaron Daly, in a way, the grandfather of ecological or, or green economics. Uh, perhaps less known work by um, an English scholar called Fred Hershier uh, on the social limits, not just the ecological limits, actually the social limits of growth. And then I think uh, Tim Jackson's work in 2009 has really brought back the issue of the social and the ecological uh, irrationality of orthodox economic growth back to the fore. And then two more recent books, one uh, by myself there from 2012, and then um, another book by Dirk uh, Philipson in 2015. So it's not as if we're bereft of uh, scholarship and a growth of scholarship on economic growth. But why is it, um, as Jackson says there in the, in the top quote, that you're seen as a madman or completely idealistic if you begin to even question uh, growth? And it's even deeper. That, to me, it seems that you know, to question growth, to argue against consumption, uh, against orthodox full employment, for example, you are seen as embarking on a fundamental act of betrayal or disloyalty of our current economic order. Uh, part of my interest is trying to unpack some of the ideological, the narrative, uh, and indeed, as I would point out, the mythical elements of why, despite many of the problems with this orthodox economic growth, fetish or objective, uh, it still persists, despite uh, many scientific and indeed moral and political arguments against it. And just in case I don't get um, enough time to go into this in great depth, my three main reasons for being critical of growth are one, the state the obvious is sustainability, um, that there, it's simply biophysically impossible for a subsystem um, of the larger biophysical system, which has as its major um, input every day is solar radiation, everything else is more or less fixed within the limits. There's, you know, regeneration capacity, but the planet isn't growing. Uh, so why would we think that the human economy, which is completely dependent upon, you know, energy, uh, metabolism, you know, the absorptive capacity of the Earth to uh, take in our, our pollution, why do we think, uh, persistent thinking, that this fixed system uh, can enable a subsystem to grow indefinitely? There are two other non-ecological reasons, again, which are not particularly innovative, but they're very standard in this heterodox literature uh, criticizing economic growth. One is equality, is that if you're egalitarian, um, economic growth may not be the strategy you want to pursue to create a less unequal society, particularly because um, economic growth, particularly under uh, consumer capitalism, is based upon the reproduction uh, and the management of uh, socioeconomic inequalities rather than addressing them. Uh, the third reason there uh, is more recent, but again has a long lineage, you could say, going back to John Stuart Mill in the, the 19th century, um, who was one of the first, I suppose, in the modern era to, in his uh, Principles of Political Economy, point out that there, there's a point beyond which um, this frenetic growth uh, machine of the economy actually begins to, in Heron Daly's words, become uneconomic. It's not our economic growth, it's uneconomic. It actually begins to detract from quality of life, 
and as I say here, human flourishing. And one of the problems with this, and again, um, I feel like, you know, a grandmother, you know, somebody telling your grandmother to suck eggs, is that what are we measuring in economic growth? Because what, what gets measured and what gets announced in our, you know, media and the, the, the evening news and so on is what we value in society. And of course, what gets measured gets done. So what is economic growth measuring? And, and see that a quote from Philipson is that it, it only counts output. It doesn't differentiate. That's what I mean by undifferentiated economic growth. Is that GDP measures, these monetary measures, which already take government policy, um, around which most political parties are orientated, which means that certainly in a lot of capitalist liberal democratic societies, our elections are reduced to beauty contests between which party can promise uh, economic growth. Uh, and you know, the quote there from Philipson, it you know, really highlights the fact that it doesn't tell us what sort of activity uh, that GDP is actually measuring. But more than that, this gets into the, the very substance of my more recent interest and the, the, the main subject of my discussion with you here uh, this morning, is that it influences what the economy is. You know, uh, GDP and economic growth is not just a neutral measurement uh, of the economy. It doesn't just describe the economy and what the economy should achieve. It actively prescribes, and in doing so, it rules certain things out and then certain things in, in terms of, as I say there at the end, it, it gives us a, a map of the world, a view of the way the world ought to be, in which if everything is a hammer, of course, then um, everything looks like a nail. And these are the things that I think you know most of you are familiar with. These things have GDP. Uh, I would recommend the first two together, uh, <laughs> uh, particularly when we're supposed to have the third one, it wasn't really smart. But these things are the growth. You know, beer, food, bicycles, sustainable transportation, education. But sadly, these things also add to GDP. Uh, divorce, which means, you know, rather than one house, you now need two. All that commuting, all the lawyers and barristers or whatever involved in the divorce. Pollution, bizarrely, can actually add to GDP. In terms of the cost, you have to outlay the pay for people to go and do it, the insurance costs and so on. And also, wars. Are good for business, uh, and sadly, business um, is good at the moment, particularly in terms of what we're hearing the drumbeats of, of war in, in the Middle East. You know, whether it's Korea, Vietnam, even the Second World War, these all are actually economic stimuli. They actually increase GDP, even though uh, what normal people would think, or most of the think, well, these are actually bad. Why are these being included within our uh, undifferentiated measure of GDP? But some of the things that aren't included in GDP, uh, to use a, a general analysis of a lot of my work is based upon um, eco-feminist political economy, is the, the, the overwhelmingly gendered work that goes on at home for free. That is not included in our GDP. That doesn't make the headlines of the evening news in terms of how many you know, hours have been given for free in terms of keeping the convivial familial relations in the home and the economy of the home going, not including GDP. Neither is what I call here sweat equity, the convivial or social economy, where people are volunteering their time to help their community and so on, not out of GDP, also no monetary exchanges doesn't count. But perhaps most tellingly, uh, our democracy uh, doesn't count in our GDP, uh, in terms of it doesn't carry with it, unless you're in a very corrupt society, which I have to say, where I live in Ireland, there are elements with brown envelopes being passed to politicians. This one accepted, of course. There is no monetary value uh, according to uh, the strength of our democracy. And again, this is nothing new. This is part of the conundrums of resilience of this particular flawed measure. You can go back to something that a few months before he passed away, uh, Robert Kennedy, a quote that many of you may be aware of, it's from 1968. You can read it there yourself, and he's really arguing that the, the good stuff in life, you know, what we regard as the essence of our, our, our flourishing, um, is not included in our, our GDP. So therefore it makes a very flawed measure if we want to get a handle on uh, you know collective human flourishing in society or a social welfare function. So despite this, why do we still persist? Our governments, our political leaders, most political parties still persist on um, 
focusing our attention and developing policies to increase uh, GDP as opposed to decreasing inequality directly to redistribution, as opposed to strengthening our democracy and our communities directly rather than using the proxy of GDP. And that's something we have to make come back to in the Q&A. So the second problem then growth, apart from the issue of measurement, is the one I mentioned already in terms of inequality. I have two quotes here, quite a distance in, in, in between them, from 72 and 91, but I think Herman Daly would have you know, been arguing this in the 70s as well. You could read them there yourself. Is that it's essentially the, um, another way of understanding the, the American dream myth. This idea that everybody can make it. Uh, and it also explains how particularly uh, America is really interested in, in understanding this growth fetish. Uh, it's that it's one of the major democracies in which you get poor people who would argue against taxes on the rich, which in many respects seems counterintuitive and indeed totally uh, socially and politically irrational, except when you understand that the compelling ideological hold of the myth of the American dream. Because, because, of course, the assumption is that even poor people can become millionaires or their children can or grandchildren. So therefore, even poor people will be against taxing the rich. Now, as we said, America is an outlier on this. It's not shared across other uh, mature capitalist uh, democracies. But I think it does get to the heart of this conundrum here that these quotes from Wallach and, and Bailey point to, is that rather than dealing with redistribution, because that sounds far too much like a Marxist or a socialist or a politics of social envy. We use growth. So it doesn't matter the size of the, of, of the slice of the pie you have. The point is, your pie slice will be bigger next year. So we, we, we only have an issue of redistribution because your size will be absolutely bigger next year. And that's essentially been our social compact in a way, particularly on the neoliberalism uh, from the 1980s. It's a way of avoiding Growth is a way of avoiding dealing with issues of redistribution and directly addressing questions of social inequality. But it also has another pernicious, uh, pernicious effect in terms of, particularly in a uh, consumer society um, in which we're talking about particularly the overdeveloped world here in terms of you know, Europe, North America, <laughs> Australasia and Japan. Uh, I certainly don't think the argument I'm making is uh, pertinent to many, uh, the, the majority world in the global south, I think, where economic growth still has some mileage. So my argument is more or less, you know, aimed at um, the, the developed or overdeveloped societies in which you have this problem here of identifying in terms of the, the snakes, uh, no ladders here, unfortunately, is the inequality uh, that that's heightened as a result of the growth fetish or the uh, the impetus, the objective towards economic growth. Because what happens in, in such societies where competition for status becomes so heightened as a result, uh, in a way, of the uh, increase in consumer uh, growth uh, the dynamics, is there's more competition, more status uh, insecurity, and it leads then to more uh, evaluation, uh, the greater sense of shame, um, which can actually be traced back to Adam Smith in terms of an understanding of the importance of people feeling that they are no longer second-class citizens uh, when they walk out into society. If you're forced to buy second-hand clothes because of your uh, situation in life, it, it seems a reflection that you've been a second-class citizen. This is something that Smith could even see back in the you know, 18th century. But the point I'm making here is that in societies oriented orient towards economic growth, in which uh, inequalities and vast differences in inequalities become rationalized, become normalized as a way to get economic growth based upon, as I show you in a moment, the other great myth of our contemporary age, the myth of the trickle down. This leads down to these inimical social, psychological, <coughs> cultural effects in terms of greater senses of anxiety and status anxieties uh, in societies that are orientated towards orthodox, undifferentiated economic growth. A third problem then which have already flagged up, and just give you some uh, a little bit of your empirical data, this is from the UK, in terms of the, uh, what's also called the crocodile uh, graph. How we can have economic growth as measured by GDP increasing over time, yes, for our lips, and we're currently 
whether or not we're coming out of the current you know, global financial recession from 2008-9, but more as economic growth is going up, and yet reported levels of happiness uh, have appreciably increased in decades. Um, so how is it, it's a very complicated story of course, but it does take the point to the issue, why isn't government policy, political parties, uh, social movements, orientated towards the left hand graph? How can we increase people's senses of happiness, of self-reported satisfaction, as opposed to using the proxy, at best, of GDP as a way to increase? Because it seems to me that we can find a much more ecologically rational, certainly less uh, resource intensive, certainly less climate changing uh, intensive way of increasing self-reported happiness without dependent upon economic growth as we currently understand it in terms of GDP. The last one there, I and mean, this really is something that you, you would all know, is you know, how can a subsystem uh, grow, uh, the human economy grow outside the confines of a fixed biophysical system? So here we have the, this is how the standard economics 101 model works. I mean, it's often, you don't get the earth, if you look at your, your standard economic textbooks, it's almost as if all, all that exists are households and firms and a market and price and supply that fixes price. There's no sense of energy, there's no sense of resources, or certainly no sense of pollution. But what we get is that, well, that's how it works when we're at one level of economic activity. You get resources in, waste out. But then, of course, if we grow the economy, this increases resources, increases waste. And of course, what we're coming up against now is the reality that, you know, if the earth was a bank, we would have bailed out, perhaps, as Fidel Castro said, uh, apparently, uh, a decade or so ago. But common nature doesn't do bailouts. Um, and this is the, the problem, is that there is a, a deep epistemological or ontological rift between the orthodox economic view of, of how the economy is, the human economy, that is completely, it's not even ecologically irrational, it's completely ecologically blind. It, it doesn't actually recognize the utter dependence of every human activity on nature, uh, on the non-human world as transformed by human ingenuity, collective effort, technology, and science, and, and, and so forth. And this is part of the problem we're, we're dealing with, that this divorce between the orthodox which is the dominant neoclassical model, in a technical term, and the biophysical reality of the planet that we live on. But here's, I want you to, anybody shout out, obviously, the difference. This is the Earth in 1955, and this is the Earth in 2015. And we see the difference. The Earth ain't growing. Uh, <laughs> In case you missed it, this is 1955. <laughs> and yet, we have the most clever people in government and political parties this belief, and it's largely based around technology, which I'll talk about it in a moment, that we can somehow decouple a growing um, economy as using energy, resources, pollution, and also measured by money. Uh, and increasingly governed by the financial system. That's another issue that I, I won't have time to get into today, but we could maybe pick it up in the QA. Is the growth of the financialization of the economy and how that is the ultimate uh, uh, the distanciation, if you like, between the human economy and the biophysical world. But how can a subsystem grow when the, the larger system is not growing? And again, this is. The reality that we're in at the moment is that we are now an ecological overshoot. You know, since about 1985 uh, in terms of using up more biophysical capacity that the Earth can replenish. Um, we cannot, you know, create um, artificial sinks from any of the resources that we are now resulting in pollution. Of course, climate change is the ultimate pollutant, heat is the ultimate pollutant that we are now essentially dealing with. And of course, it's interesting that I'm speaking to you, you know, uh, a day or two after the, the, the great, um, well, great and very commas, of course, people like me are never satisfied with what governments do, but it's a good step in the right direction in terms of the, the climate deal uh, in Paris, but it still has it at its heart, as I point out in a moment, um, a, a tech optimism 
which I think is part of the mythic element that I want to talk about in terms of economic growth. And this is a, probably, I think it's the best uh, image. I quite like images as a way of communicating, particularly to um, students who have the attention span of gnats these days, they playing having their attention. But this is the situation that we're in. Uh, you know, if we keep going the way we're going, uh, you know, we're going to you know, we're gonna get where we're headed. I mean, we have scientific reports telling us that we simply cannot keep growing the economy, using resources, creating pollution, uh, and particularly in terms of our energy systems where we are systematically addicted to, particularly to oil. So this is the problem that we're dealing with. How do we get uh, a good ship economic growth to reverse? It seems to me that we can move beyond the economic growth because it, it, essentially the economic system we have at the moment is like a bicycle. It either goes and grows or it collapses. It has no other default position. It's based on a complete <coughs> positive feedback mechanism. It's got no negative feedback mechanisms that doesn't result in social and economic recession. That's part of the conundrum that we have to deal with. How can we create, in my view, a post-growth uh, economy, but one that doesn't have as an intended result uh, major negative impacts in terms of social recession, uh, in terms of unemployment that nobody wants, and so on. And I've got a few ideas that I'll share with you towards the end. And to move then into the more ideational or ideological and mythic and the religious aspects of economic growth, um, any of you may be familiar with uh, frames and the importance of language and how do we actually frame and understand the frame of economics. Um, I've got a quote here from a wonderful book, very short book, available uh, to download uh, very cheaply, uh, called Frame Spotting. Um, and it's this assumption that we have in our society, the framing of growth and economic growth is that it's good. It, it, it is just unassumingly and it's unapologetically and uncomplicatedly a good thing. And it plays off notions of growth in its normal understanding, means things like maturation, means things like development, and it means things like you know moving forward and progress. And so wrapped up in the concept of growth, this is what makes it particularly hard perhaps to dislodge. And I'm still not quite sure how we may dislodge growth and uh, whether or not we can come up with alternatives that don't directly attack growth because it's, it, it, it becomes almost like super abundant in positive, affirmative um, ideas and feelings and aspirations. And I think it's the way it's been framed over such a long time that growth, ideally, from an, an ecological point of view, but not from a social point of view, should almost be seen in the overdeveloped world as like cancer. That's essentially what cancer is. Uh, cancer is the growth of a healthy uh, set of cells that grows outside the healthy threshold and then becomes dangerous to the, to the organism or, or the body. To me, that's the stage of growth that we're in now, is we're in cancerous stage of growth, which you can see how difficult that would be to contrast it to you know, the strong, buoyant economic growth and trying to present orthodox economic growth as cancerous would be quite difficult strategically even though it may make a lot of scientific and the normative sense. And I may need your help in terms of some of the answers and questions that we have in terms of how can we move beyond the language of growth. And I do think just again, that economic growth as a myth. And in many ways, these are just different ways of understanding growth as a story. It's a narrative. Um, I begin, you know, uh, it should be obvious by now, in rejecting the notion that economics, whether it's neoclassical economics or feminist or ecological, is objective. Uh, all forms of economics are forms of political economy, in my view. They all come replete with value judgments, with the way the world ought to be, particular notions about how the good life should be lived or what it is, and particular notions of what the human being is or what the human being ought to be seen as. But it seems to me that economic growth, even though we live in a world with, as we're doing now, we've got Skype, we've got iPhone 6s, we've may, God forbid, have iPhone 10s at some point. We think because we live in such a technologically advanced age, that we are so superior to previous ages of human generations who lived in, you know, mythic, uh, lived in more religious or less enlightened uh, times. My view is very simple. We just have more clever myths. We have myths that we can back up by fancy statistics. 
Uh, and one of the things is, as Tim Jackson points out there, is our myth of economic growth. And I think the quote from the penalty uh, is a useful uh, view that actually the it's not a lie that we should be afraid of and trying to seek out. And I suppose this is part of my investigation into this idea of economic growth. It's not necessarily a lie, but it's mythic. Uh, and therefore it makes us um, you know, forget about looking deeper into the issue, which is I think the point of the quote there from JFK, is that it makes us fall prey to a simple assumption of the common sense uh, without, um, without critically evaluating what it is we're talking about when we unapologetically and uncritically celebrate and argue for economic growth. And of course the essence of the mythic element of economic growth in me is this notion of cornucopianism. Uh, John Dreisek is there, this is a uh, tip to John's hat in terms of seeing this as one of the dominant discourses that John discusses in, uh, in, in one of his books. But it seems to me that economic growth offers this almost perennial uh, human desire, this mythic desire of a horn of plenty, uh, which has a particular resonance, as I say, here in Western uh, cultures, uh, goes right back to the, to the Greek myth that we can create, mostly through our technology and ingenuity, we can take the scarcity of the earth and make it abundant. And uh, you can see there the quote from uh, Johnson uh, in terms of the uh, way in which economic growth for me is, is wrapped up and part of its positive evaluation is tied up into you know, the myth of Cockney in English mythology or the myth of heaven on earth, of the land of milk and ambrosia. And economic growth has all of those elements of it which are extremely attractive and which also then makes it very difficult often to dislodge. And if you criticize it, uh, you're seen as a naysayer or you're seen as an aesthetic or you're seen as somebody who's denying the poor and really when it comes to the developing world, you're denying the poor opportunities to go through the same stage of growth and development that we have enjoyed in uh, the West or overdeveloped world. But I do think that this gets to the heart. This cornucopian idea is based upon what I want here techno mythic wish fulfillment. Um, and to me, it, it harks back to uh, a, a very old myth, certainly in Western culture, that's, that's had various iterations. Uh, for me, the origins of a lie in Achilles, everyone knows Achilles from his heel. You know, that was a bit of his, uh, of his body that wasn't dipped in the river Styx, I think his name was, that made him invincible. But actually, Achilles possessed a lance. That could heal the wounds it inflicted. You know, an extremely handy, I think, uh, mythical, and I think very accurate way of describing uh, the belief system and the wish fulfillment that operates behind economic growth. So, economic growth can be said, well, it's a dirty phase of economic growth, it's going to cause pollution, it's going to cause inequality, it's going to mean, you know, people from the land will be in the city, shanty towns, but you know what? It can come good in the end. So economic growth is the cause, the wound. It's going to wound the earth, it's going to wound social relations, it's going to dislocate people from their certain ways of lives. You know, and you can see this in you know, classic books like Carl Polanyi, The Great Transformation, looking at the, the social dislocation as a result of capitalism and the release of the market system from social and other norms. But the Achilles Lance idea here, this mythic notion, is that economic growth can heal the wounds it inflicts. And you can see it here particularly, and I would say it's, it, and I have a look at it in great detail, the, uh, the Paris climate deal, but I get you, at the heart of that deal is what I'm calling here supply side solutions. Uh, how can we basically green production? How can we keep what I'm calling biofuel the Hummer? How can we keep a green version of what we have now uh, rather than question whether or not we need the Hummer or whether or not we need the current social order, whether or not that's actually socially or ecologically rational? This technological, you could say, arrogance or naivety. And uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not a Luddite. We do need technological solutions. We do need technological innovation. Although I do wish there was more talk and, and research in the social innovation. You know, experiments in new ways of living, low carbon, low energy ways of living, rather than seeing innovation uh, being co opted into a purely technological dimension. So I think that's part of the, uh, the argument I would like to make is this. To, unpack innovation or, or this large innovation and indeed entrepreneurship away from its commercial and technological focus. And I do think though that there's a compelling argument that most orthodox is then rather than policies 
and uh, the hazard of guess the current climate change uh, deal that's going in Paris is based on greening the current system. How can we decarbonize in a way that's going to keep economic growth going? I think I even heard President Obama basically celebrate the deal in Paris as a way, another new opportunity for economic growth. And never mind getting into what I think is a deeply disturbing uh, development. Again, all this talk of the Anthropocene and so on, which has dominated STEM science in the last uh, year or so. Um, but this deeply mythical thinking around basically packing the planet in terms of these unproven technologies upon which policies are being made and based on carbon capture and sequestration, which is being unproven, or indeed geoengineering through, you know, uh, putting filings up in the atmosphere and so on. And it does seem to me that there is a, a, a direction of travel in this mythical thinking that we want to keep what we have, to keep on going in the direction that we're traveling, but try and do it in a more low carbon way. And to me, this is a mythic uh, wish fulfillment because we simply do not have, in my view, the technology to be able to decouple completely from the ecological and carbon impact of our um, production and consumption um, uh, strategies and, and, and lifestyle. Because what, what none of these policies deal with is the well known genes paradox or the rebound. So, that, for example, you know, the classic one is the modern cars. You know, the internal combustion engines are, yes, certainly much more efficient, so you can get more miles per gallon. Which say that's brilliant, that means there's less pollution, using less oil and diesel and so on. But the problem is that these supply side solutions that focus only on production do not tackle the issue of consumption. All of the ecological advantages of the technological improvements in fuel efficiency of our car fleets are completely wiped out by the fact that we're now all driving more and we all own more cars. These are consumption issues that do not have technological solutions. These are deeply political and cultural solutions, which of course, most of mainstream politics and systemic development strategies want to avoid. But it seems to me we do have to start dealing with the consumption side of the equation in terms of moving beyond unsustainability. And then to move then just quickly um, from growth viewed as a, as a, as a as a myth of a mythological element of growth, to growth as an ideology. And I, I view ideology here in, in many ways you can view it as for simplicity and uh, in terms of the time I have with you, two forms of the ideological dimensions of growth. One is, I've mentioned already, I just simply mean that all economics are forms of the economy. There is no value-free, objective, scientific notion of, of economics. I mean, I often view Neoclassical economics as a form of physics envy, uh, you know, trying to render through you know ever more eloquent and quite beautiful looking statistics and more mathematical sophistication and, and econometrics and so on. But the reality is, statistics, as somebody once said, it's a bit like drunk using a lamppost. You can use it for support rather than illumination. And actually, the use of statistics simply may mean that the emperor has no clothes. But they're dressed up with more fancy version of having no clothes. And see, that's part of where modern economics has gone wrong in confusing the mathematical interpretation or representation of what they think the world actually is in comparison to how the world actually should be or how the world actually is from a biophysical and social point of view. So, from my view, very simply, every form of understanding the economy, whether it's feminist, Marxist, uh, conservative, it doesn't matter. They are all forms of political economy, which is where modern economics begins. I mean, go back to Adam Smith or Thomas Maltis or David Ricardo, it was very clear that they could see the connections between how we view the economy and their often, you know, rudimentary in our views, perhaps, uh, technical understanding of the economy. They were informed by values that they were very upfront about what it was they were viewing uh, their activities to be in the service of, the creation of a better society. Rather than this absolute fiction, which neoclassical economics still insists on portraying, that it's somehow technical and it is neutral. It isn't. There's nothing on the sort. It has a particular ideological dimension, like any other form of economics. So, suppose the, the, the weak element of my argument here against neoclassical economics and its fetishization of economic growth is simply a plea for pluralism. 
Why are we living democracies which, where we value variety and pluralism and debate? Why, when we come to the economy, we only see there's one uh, show in town, the neoclassical economic growth oriented view of the economy? This is a deep, uh, deep, deep disturbing development in the last, I'd say, 20 or 30 years in the teaching of economics. I mean, I'm old enough to have been uh, taught in, in University College Dublin rudimentary Marxist, socialist, feminist development, uh, non Western economics. I doubt modern students of economics at universities are given the opportunity to actually see that there is a pluralism. There isn't just one size fits all in terms of how we understand. The economy. And the second way of using ideology here is more classic, you could say, Marxist or Marxian uh, approach is that economic growth actually serves the interest of the minority in society rather than the majority. And one of the uh, issues here, of course, is Herman Daly's, you can read it there yourself, in terms of it's in the interest of the elite that we have this particular notion of the economy. And the last quote there from Matthews and Matthews in terms of framing it in a particular way serves particular interests. This is a lady called Kyla, uh, who I think particularly likes this uh, <laughs> image. Uh, it's a nice summary way of inequality. And part of this ideological dimension, uh, this is a very bad representation, not very good at photoshopping of Antonio Gramsci. Uh, of, uh, of ideology. Uh, this is not Gramsci, by the way. <laughs> but it does seem to me that you know, I'm using here the, the matrix. I mean, this in a way is the common sense of economics. Um, you can see there that part of the ideological function of economics is that it becomes normal, it's the common sense. It explains why Jackson could say that anybody who questions economic growth is seen as mad or a lunatic. That economic growth has become the new normal. It's our new modern myth or narrative, as I say here. And one example I just quickly want to give you about uh, is perennial optimality. Anybody who's had to suffer Econ 101. It seems to me it's a, it's a very good example of this ideological, the, the way in which modern economics uses axiomatic thinking. So you smuggle in your normative values by common axioms. And one of the best ones that I know of is the way of which is basically, as it says there, that you, you, know, you can't make a, a move uh, to, to a different um, resource allocation without making somebody worse off. Um, and the way I thought there in you know, theories like John Rawls and his theory of justice, and just seemed to me that actually, let's name it for what it is. This is basically an axiomatic way of smuggling in anti distributive policies. You know, it is possible to make more people better off and increase overall welfare by redistribution. But in other words, Pareto optimality is a way of, of, of purchasing economic growth, which is a way then, of course, of denying the empirical technical and neoclassical economic terms, validity or redistribution. And this is what you end up with. There's this idea that trickle down becomes the ideological uh, common sense. Um, a rather better way of understanding it, if not a little bit inelegant, is from John Kenneth Dalbraith. I mean, this is the dominant uh, common sense of our economic system in terms of the trickle down. <laughs> and finally, this we get to close on. Growth, I think, can also be viewed as a religion. And there's been many studies, this one from Daniel Bell, and there's also Robert Nelson there, in terms of the meaning making tied up with economic growth, in terms of everything from making the world uh, purposeful. Um, I think also some of my more recent work is on trying to unpack some of the religious notions around scarcity, and why scarcity is seen as the original sin, I think, in certainly neoclassical economics. Uh, it also explains in this religious dimension the good of a good's life here, in terms of, you can trace this back in a variety of ways, whether it's neighbors, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of the capitalism and so on. But there is a, at, at its heart, you can understand economic growth and the tenacity with which people hold on to it, 
and who, with which people aspire to it, and which people are willing to sacrifice uh, many aspects of uh, contemporary societies to, certainly under the auspices of austerity, and, and as a form of religious commitment. And ultimately, of course, uh, our modern economists and those who are in charge of our economy, or at least in charge of the, the rhetoric and the ideological promotion of economic growth, almost present economic growth as an idea of heaven on earth. And you want an example that this is not just a, an old idea, this is a very live debate. This is uh, Richard Norgard, that some of you would know in the room, uh, in, and this debate going on at this very moment on the Great Transition Initiative uh, based on responses to Richard's article, uh, The Church of Economism and its Discontents. I mean, basically pointing out that economic growth and neoclassical economics is a form of religious sentiment in many respects. You have to understand it and treat it uh, as such. And only then we're left with this question. You know, why is it it's often easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of orthodox, as they say, undefensive economic growth? They can add in there, why is, it, why is it the end of the world is more easy to imagine than the end of capitalism? And I think it's got something to do with some of the issues I've raised there, of the, the ideological, mythical, and the religious dimensions of this particular idea. Uh, never mind this. To go back to what I was mentioning earlier in terms of where it, the issue never is, and I'm currently speaking now as a politician, the issue in politics is never about the lack of money. We have money we can spend on wars. We were able to mobilize uh, billions of pounds in Britain and America and France to go and fight a war in Iraq, uh, yet we can't deal with um, education problems, we can't deal with the, our healthcare system. The issue is never money, it's the political will and the social mobilization around that. So how do we get beyond economic growth? Um, and not just because an Irish man uh, late at night and still a bit sober, but certainly we need new stories. Because to me, economic growth is best understood as, as a story that's now outlived its usefulness. Um, and I think these issues I've raised with you in terms of the ideological, mythic, and religious dimensions are simply different aspects of the story uh, narrative at the heart of economic growth. So my suggestions in terms of how we move beyond that, I think we need more expansive notions of the economy, thinking to include the convivial and the general economy, the unpaid work, particularly of women. We need certainly to move beyond GDP, and whether it's genuine press indicators, the Human Development Index, or, or a dashboard where we're measuring different aspects of how society is doing. Um, this issue then of moving beyond different, uh, undifferentiated, differentiated growth. I like, quite like libraries. I, I don't mind the growth in libraries. I don't think I mind perhaps the growth in kidney dialysis machines. So you can be critical of growth, but they're not actually critical of growth per se across the board. It's about which areas of our economy and for what we want them to grow. In other words, it's a much more political approach in terms of how we actually start to organize our economy. And particularly then for the developed um, global south, the global justice issues, is to see that actually, you know, in the overdeveloped world, we uh, uh, reiterated again, in Europe, North America, Australasia, and Japan, we do not need more growth. What we need is smarter redistribution, a smarter growth in certain areas rather than a carte blanche, undifferentiated growth in the economy. And then, of course, it goes without saying, start moving beyond quantitative measures to qualitative ones, uh, rather than measuring consumerism and GDP monetary measures, actually measuring suffering and quality of life, uh, as I say here, from more to better. So what if the best things in life really are free? Um, there's also the philosophical issue, I think, at the heart of our modern fetish of economic growth, that something is good simply because it's desired. You know, the power of marketing, uh, the power of consumerism, in terms of encouraging us the right crap we don't need to impress people we don't really care about. But yet, you know, in terms of the marketing message, that's you being a good, loyal citizen. The buy this stuff, because it keep people in work. It keeps the economic system going. And I think, for me, in terms of developing and trying to figure out a way beyond this fetish around economic growth, is to be aware of thresholds. Uh, with our resource environmental human. I do have a suggestion, I think, that we need to move to something like economic security, 
uh, in terms of sustainable prosperity and seeing that prosperity is not the same as economic growth, indeed development itself is not the same as economic growth. And to see that as a public debate and, and research and politics around improving the resource efficiency of human flourishing rather than economic production and orthodox understandings of efficiency. And that actually has to be what I call it a just transition so that those who are most vulnerable are the ones who have to pay most for the transition beyond our unsustainable economic growth uh, economy. And indeed, that has to be also democratic. And this is part of the qualitative element of this transition beyond economic growth. That to, um, to paraphrase the, the great American revolutionary saying, there should be no carbon taxation without citizen participation, not just representation. And to me, it seems to finish then. There is no limit to these things, imagination, love, community, education, the democratization and, and justice, these things that are not the right limits. And these are the things we have to, I think, start valorizing and developing policies around, maybe the, the notion of care, the caring economy and the importance of care, for what it means to be human and to live a good human life. So does it mean that there is an opportunity in this transition that I'm talking about here from unsustainable economic growth to create a better, more just and satisfying world, and not just a greener version of the current one. And then there's no relation, he's a berry, I'm a barry. Um, <laughs> he's probably had a nice time, I'm still sober. And that seems to me the conundrum um, that we're in. That we need to develop um, a, a political will and a backbone, and actually start challenging consumption, uh, encouraging our readers and our parties uh, and democratic institutions. Never mind how to teach economics, it's our focusing on wastefulness and overconsumption. And with that, there ended the secular sermon. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
It's uh, got monetary values attached to it. It's now being traded on financial markets. And what we're seeing is it's a bit of an illusion, but there's this sense that money money can defy the laws of thermodynamics, uh, even though the real economy cannot. And so I think a lot of the reason why economists think that those of us who question growth are a bit crazy is because they don't see that there is a limit to the growth of money. And in fact, what we see today, recent figures from the Bank of the, for International Settlements, the size of the global derivatives market, and derivatives are financial instruments that investors invest in, they're based on an underlying asset, but they're separated from it. They're, they're, uh, they're a derivative. Uh, the value of derivatives in the global economy is around $800 trillion today, and that's 10 times the size of the global economy, in other words, GDP, uh, the global GDP. So we do have a weird superstructure of uh, this financialized world, and I think we need to pay more attention to it. Many economists say that, that those financial derivatives have no relationship to the real world because it's just kind of, you know, financial speculation. But it does have a relationship to the real world. It does link back to those underlying assets. When we think about financial bubbles in land and agriculture and other commodities and oil, it has real impact on the real economy. We need to pay attention to that. And that brings me to the third point that I wanted to raise, which is simply about accountability within the system. Uh, when we have this kind of hyper-financialization that we have today with all of this investment in these, in these kinds of derivatives, and a disconnect, or a, it's difficult to connect the financial investor from the real world impact, it's hard to have accountability within that system. How do you hold these investors responsible? It's a very difficult task. I've done a little bit of research uh, on uh, responsibility initiatives uh, around financial speculation in the agricultural sector, and some consultants interviewed all these financial investors. They said that they didn't see any connection between what they were doing in the real world's impact. And so therefore, they didn't feel that they needed to be responsible. And I, I think that's wrong. I think we need more responsibility in the financial system. And one, you know, a, a couple ways to do this is to think about how, coming back to the first point, how we organize our money system. If we move away from a system that creates money through debt and maybe move more towards, uh, you know, full reserve banking, where you only lend out money that actually exists. You could have a more stable money supply, you could reduce uh, financial speculation and bubbles and uh, et cetera. And it might, in a sense, force some kind of degrowth and ground, uh, ground financial activity to be more connected to the real economy. And that's when the feedback loops then become more apparent. And I think that would be uh, one way, perhaps, I'd be curious to hear what John has to say, to think about ways in which uh, we can bust the, the growth. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. I, I want to thank you, John. It's always a uh, very engaging and uh, fascinating talk, and I appreciate uh, your time and your insights. Uh, like Jennifer, I thought I would just pick up on, on one of your uh, perceptive points and then uh, tell one uh, story um, to elaborate my, my thoughts. Uh, so uh, I really thought that was a perceptive uh, point, uh, you know, with the humor of bringing Gramsci into the conversation, that uh, not only is uh, this myth or ideology of unstable economic growth um, very powerful, it also has a, a tremendous power to survive criticism, to not only survive it, but to then absorb it and then turn it to its advantage. And it does this through um, uh, giving a further legitimacy to the idea of unsustainable economic growth, as well as actually, I would argue, creating more of the same type of economic growth. So I thought that was very insightful, John, and very, very important to remember. Uh, I'll give uh, one story uh, to, to, to give a sense of, of how I think this works and, and how it might empower us as, as scholars and, and as, as consumers to, to potentially critique it. And that's the story of, of what I see happening uh, among Fortune 500 companies around the world. Uh, from my own research, uh, I, I've been looking hard at these companies. And starting in about 2005, you know, these are difficult uh, time periods to pick precisely. But roughly 2005, these companies, uh, some of the biggest, best known in the world, ones like Walmart, um, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle, Unilever, Monsanto, 
these companies started to shift away from what I see as corporate social responsibility, which was more about greenwash and more reactive, to uh, a corporate social responsibility that was much more proactive, that was actually engaging with the community of critics, and particularly those talking about sustainability, in ways that was about trying to join and become part of, and then eventually start to try and control the language and shift some of the definitions and understanding of what the original criticisms were about. And I think over the last 10 years, one of the consequences of this is we've seen these corporations now increasingly say that they are sustainable or they are sustainability leaders. They're now becoming very assertive in saying it's governments that are laggards and it's NGOs that don't have the global capacity <coughs> these things forward. And one of the um, outcomes of this is you see these as now some of the places where you see the grandest claims. So you see companies like Coca-Cola, Walmart, Nestle, saying things like they are aspiring to a zero water footprint, 100% sustainable sourcing, to carbon neutrality. And then they give years, right? We're going to do this by 2030, by 2050. The one I've been doing a lot of research on is just about every single Fortune 500 company has now said they are pursuing zero deforestation, often by 2030. And why I think this is very important to John's analysis is these companies have started to change the meaning of sustainability so that it's not about sustainability in the ecological sense that John's talking about, but it's sustainability of business. And one of the things that's happening is these companies are managing to use sustainability as a concept to actually achieve many traditional business um, objectives. That includes things like greater efficiency, that includes things like competitive advantage, that includes things like the ability to grow more. And they're doing this actually in ways that look quite enticing. Increasing recycling, improving the energy efficiencies, um, reducing the amount of waste, changing their packaging. This is all leading to a lot of things that look like progress when in fact it's not necessarily so. And one of the reasons this is such a powerful trend is I think this has become very, very enticing to many of the large non-governmental organizations around the world. And one of the consequences of the rise of what I think about as big business sustainability is it's leading to a corporatization of a lot of the large non-governmental organizations that have partnered with these companies, that have accepted money from these companies, that are increasingly using the same language of economic growth that John is critical of. So now the critics are saying things like, Nestle is a leader in the world. Walmart is the most sustainable big retail company in the world. These are actual coming from not just WWFs of the world, but you can even see folks now from Greenpeace, no offense, John, but you, uh, I can show you some examples. So Greenpeace leaders now talking about corporations as the critical leaders in the world. And the final point I'll make here in terms of how this is turning to the advantage of those who are protecting this myth and ideology of economic growth is when NGOs and corporations are all telling us that this is the way forward, that all we need to do is buy eco products, have certification, have things be more efficient, consumers start to buy into this and think small changes will work so that we can put biofuels into our hummers and save the world. So I agree completely, John, that we need new stories and I'd also add that we need to keep pushing to reveal the magician's tricks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> that a few additional points. Let's start maybe with a survey of the audience. Um, I know this, uh, these techniques of GDP have been around since GDP was invented, and I think they've been getting uh, much more prevalent in recent times, uh, you know, hopefully. Uh, but maybe you can, I can see a show of hands, maybe from uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> from one to five. One being, this is all completely new. I've never heard this before. To five, this is all <clears throat> old news. I've heard all these stories before, and I'm completely up to speed with everything that John said. One to five. Which one to five? <laughs> one is all new, five is heard it before. Do we have choices in between? Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Well, how about the other open? I find it really interesting. That's fine, too. I'm just trying to get the background of the audience. And it seems to me like most people have heard these arguments before. 
understand why GDP is not the appropriate uh, goal to be involved, uh, et cetera. And I think the, the real questions now become, if we all know this, and I think we're not the only ones who know this, I think this is actually fairly widely known, even in the, in the economics community, sort of, you know, press economists hard enough, they will admit that uh, GDP is not, uh, you know, a policy goal. It's really a very specialized measure of, of activities, as John, as John pointed out. But I think the real questions are how, you know, why has it persisted so long? And, and more importantly, how do we get beyond uh, this, this reliance on GDP? And I think that is really going to take a, a regime shift, you know, to a completely different economy. This is something that ecological economists like myself have been working on you know, for, for decades now. And the Society for Ecological Economics has been around since 19, 1989. Uh, but, you know, it still has not made as fast a progress as we, as we all would, would have liked. Uh, so, um, one thing I've been working on recently is that maybe we need to think of this uh, really as an addiction, as a trap. You know, that the society is, is addicted to the system uh, because of all the positive feedbacks. And that, um, you know, maybe we can learn something from what actually works to overcome individual addictions, to overcome this addiction to growth. And to, to GDP and consumerism, and et cetera, and get to a different, a different world. And what seems to work at the individual level is well, what doesn't work, the worst thing you can do uh, for an addict is to say, <clears throat> you're doing the wrong thing, you've got to stop doing this, you know, this will kill you. And in fact, that's exactly what we have been saying to society for, uh, for decades now. Not that it's not true, you know, obviously, this is, this is the truth. But if what you want is behavior change and you want to get the, the system to move, it's counterproductive. It's the wrong way to, to approach the, uh, uh, the transition. So what does work um, in overcoming addiction? One thing that seems to work is something called motivational interviewing, which is a, a way of engaging with addicts uh, to uh, talk about their goals and what, what they're doing with achieving, actually achieving their goals, and, and, uh, and then sort of develop plans, you know, in a more, in a more, a less confrontational, more collaborative way. Um, so what we are recommending as an analogy to that at the societal level, we don't want to, I don't think we can just change individual people's behavior. I think you have to change the whole society, the structure, the monetary system, the rules of the game, uh, the advertising system. So it's, it's much more than just getting people to change their opinions because they're still operating within the system. And I don't think they can break out of that system effectively without the system itself changing. Uh, what we can do is, is put forth um, alternative visions of the future, uh, sort of a scenario planning approach, and actually get the public engaged in, in, uh, in, in uh, responding to uh, uh, ranking, building on those alternative visions. We can, uh, and we're doing this actually with a survey in Australia next semester, part of the uh, problem-based course here at ANU. We're going to survey the Australian public and say, here are all four alternative visions of the future. Uh, one of them is the sort of <clears throat> great transition, sustainability vision that incorporates all of the things that we've been, been talking about, that lays it out in a way that people can actually relate to and understand, see themselves living in that world. Uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, the alternatives would be business as usual, we keep going that way, and some, a couple of other alternatives. Um, and hopefully by getting people engaged in that discussion of their goals, the, the same development goal, that there's a similar or related kind of process at the global scale, the discussion of the, the overall goals for society. In fact, to me that's what democracy should really be all about, is having a discussion among the entire population about, about what our shared goals are and how we, and then how, how we can go, go about achieving them. Uh, but as John points out, you know, we are stuck in uh, the conventional vision of business as usual. There's no alternative sort of out there on the table. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this, this is an idea to put out there. And I, I also should, should mention that there, is, there has been a lot of progress in, uh, in changing uh, the way we look at these things. And, and uh, one, one thing that's quite encouraging is the, uh, the, the states of Maryland and Vermont in the United States have adopted the genuine progress indicator as their major indicator of success. Uh, the city of Shanghai has now, uh, the mayor of Shanghai said that they're no, no longer using GDT as their measure of, uh, of progress. Uh, <clears throat> John didn't go into details about the, the GPI, but it does um, incorporate inequality. It adjusts for inequality. It incorporates the, uh, the cost of environmental damages and social damages, and even uh, human capital damages. 
Um, and it gives us some very interesting results when you apply it. Uh, we've done some work um, just synthesizing the studies that have been done around the world. It's been estimated for 17 different countries. Um, and when you <clears throat> come up with a, a global indicator, GDP has been going up since 1950. Uh, the GPI tracked it till about 1980 and then leveled off and started to decline because of these uh, increasing inequality and reducing environmental damages. So you can argue that even if you're for economic growth, you uh, haven't had it you know, for the last three decades uh, globally in a real sense once you, once you adjust for the, the cost of that, of that growth. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, I think we need to stop talking about growth and start talking about uh, development and making that distinction very clear, as Herman David has done many times. You know, growth means getting bigger, development means getting better. We don't need to get bigger anymore, at least in, in most countries, in order to get better. Uh, but we have to start measuring what better really means and not, and not continue to measure uh, just, just what getting bigger means. Um, and I should say, too, that uh, there are alternative uh, economics courses going on. There's, uh, we'll be doing, a, uh, myself and a colleague will be offering an ecological economics course at the proper school next, uh, next semester. So if any of you are interested, or have students who might be interested, uh, of the locals anyway. Actually, we'll do it online, so, uh, as well as uh, locally, so you might be uh, interested in, in taking that. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. And this is an area that I want to research more. Um, but you're raising the question about confidence in the money system and its connectivity to growth. Because it's like John was saying, you know, growth is like the bicycle and you get off the feet. Yeah. Or if you stop pedaling, you're going to stop and crash. Um, and I think you're right because um, because the money system is, provi like is providing credit and it basically is fueling that kind of consumption and growth and then uh, economic activity broadly because of, because of debt and uh, borrowing. But I think we have to also step back and remember that money is simply an idea. It's something that we created as society, and we can reimagine money in different ways. And I know it might sound scary. It's like, I mean, Herman Daly has a great quote. If, you have, if you're not confused about the money system, it's because you haven't thought about it enough. Um, I think that's a great quote. Because we do just take it for granted. And I think there are ways we can reimagine it. And I'm just intrigued. I don't know much about um, their activities, but there's a group in the UK called Positive Money, and they have a whole series of videos and uh, proposals for how we could change that system and build confidence into it. By but they, they argue that we shouldn't be lending money, like lending to create money. We should be spending to create money. And so instead of letting banks issue money from the private sector, we should have a committee and a central bank and make societal decisions about how we want to spend money into the economy. And they say we can do that through investing in solar and other kinds of renewable energy, and et cetera. And that could build more confidence, and it actually, they argue, uh, and even Martin Wolf from the Financial Times is on board with this, and you know, it's, not, it's not crazy. 
<laughs> and, and in fact, he's, he argues this is attractive across the political spectrum, that it creates a more stable and steady money supply that is less prone to crashes. And I think that would build more confidence in the system we have now, which is very prone to financial crashes. Good, Catherine. Thank you very much for your question. Um, uh, I last year uh, uh, took uh, co-author of the Indian Baron published a book called Protesting with the subtitle Corporatization of Activism, which tried to look at why uh, so many of the large multinational NGOs have actually gone into these partnerships, accepted um, uh, so many um, you know, business arrangements, co-branding, cause marketing, uh, but in particular setting up these certification programs and these collaborative enterprises with often groups in, in developed countries. What I don't have in that book is actually the question, which is actually quite riveting to me, right? That now there's kickback happening in the developing country, and they're angered at this kind of relationship. And uh, all I can say is I don't know the answer to that, but boy, that, that's exciting for me to know. I mean, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, um, Kaylin and Lucy Buckley, another rep, the uh, Discount Studies Perspective. On the slide where you talked about the human economy and the environment, how can the subsystem grow beyond the boundaries of non-growing larger systems? Well, resources in way south. For the discard studies folks, that's actually resources in and quite a lot of resources out. And there's a positive way we can think about that through recycling and the reuse and reclaiming of various um, substances. And I think it throws a different spin on this on this notion, but it's also from a political economy perspective, some very negative things happening. Um, you know, waste to energy incineration is the other way in which we're seeing that that, that, that process happening. Uh, but at the same time, that is um, empowering a lot of major corporations and very large um, political, you know, economic actors are moving in on this. And also I'm finding in what we're doing that some of, a lot of this is displacing people, it's displacing communities. You can see it from a resource studies perspective very violent impacts in many ways of oh, this recycling, reuse economy. And I was wondering how ecological economists think about this, or how you feel like this might, this process of turning waste into resources, this new resource frontier might change the perspectives of, of growth and, and growth and, I guess, new growth. Well, do you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. No, uh, Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, it, it sounds like you're talking about the circular economy. Is that the, it's like in Europe, this is the concept that we have, this idea of almost like uh, industrial ecology. So the effluent and the pollution of one industry becomes the, the resource of another, and anything in nature and so on. Um, and I think there's many positive aspects of that, you know, your, um, I think is it, is it New Zealand that had an aspiration to be a zero waste um, economy and so on? Um, I, I didn't quite follow how a, a circular economy might lead to, if I understand you correctly, sacrifice zones that there would be communities displaced because of recycling activity. Um, has this got to do with essentially rich Western overdeveloped countries shipping off their toxic crap? Somewhere, no. Um, so, how do you get it? Oh gosh, it's a really interesting set of phenomena, and I guess, well, you can't, but I'm sending all this tomorrow. Um, that what you're seeing is uh, actually, I can give an example through the clean development mechanism is that CDM projects, a lot, about a thousand of the CDM projects are waste related projects where you go in and you cap landfills or you take waste and you incinerate it, and that for one thing is displacing waste pickers. You have waste pickers showing up at, at UN and C COPs now to protest. Um, you have um, very dangerous facilities being placed or expanded in, in, in communities that tend to be very vulnerable. But the more I talk to people, you see this sort of, they, they frame it in terms of displacement and um, almost like violence against the community, and it's a really new and different perspective on this. The sort of positive spin of the zero net waste movement. Yeah. Um, that anyway, so that's kind of where I'm coming from with that perspective. It's less about the toxic waste trade, although admittedly, large mining companies are now moving into that. This sort of urban mining is both positive but also very critical of this, this phenomenon. Um, it's, it's a really, I'm just trying to grapple now with the macro implications, so um, this is why this question seems a little. Uh, 
Uh, if I get clarification, maybe at the, uh, the response I would give it has to do with the macro level. If you, and um, this is my real concern with this course of the Anthropocene and um, you know global earth management talk is that it completely neglects the issues of the maldistribution, the unequal distribution of power and the impacts. So overall, for example, CO2 or toxic waste are kept within a sustainable planetary limit, but that may mean that it's, it's unevenly distributed to many communities around the planet. And what's happened there, of course, is that we've not solved the problem, we simply displaced it, often in, in, in space or in, in even time. I mean, the classic one here seems to be nuclear energy. You know, one of the biggest technical moral issues with nuclear energy, of course, is that we have not come up with a way to deal with the toxic uh, waste. So what we do is we, we simply pass it on in, in time. So it seems to me that what you're uh, getting towards there is, you know, the, 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 the limits of these technological solutions, even if it's about recycling and a circular economy, uh, in terms of overcoming a just transition to essentially, uh, you know, in terms of what Bob was saying there, to a steady state economy. Uh, and this does mean, you know, one of the issues I raised in my talk is we have to start talking about consumption. Uh, whether it's talking about it in the, the beautiful French word decroissance, so that we have to degrow to enable the development space for other parts of the world. But this is a toxic issue in politics. Nobody wants to talk about challenging consumption because to do so, and I speak now as, 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 a, as a politician, you're as welcome as a fart in a spacesuit. <laughs> Maybe to just add, while you're moving the microphone, um, certainly recycling as much as we can is, is, uh, is something we, we want to do, and you know, an ecological systems manage to do that uh, pretty completely, although there's, there's always going to can never be that perfectly. But I think um, thinking about a circular economy that's also growing, uh, I think, is a, is a difficult concept to get across. Once we've stabilized the economy and we're in a steady state in terms of material consumption, and then I think we can think about how to how to really recycle as much as as much as possible, and I think that is that is the direction that we need to go in. Uh, but then that that just allows us to then start worrying about how to do better, how to, how to develop other parts of the economy, how to distribute that production more equitably, uh, and have you know, more democracies, the things that actually do contribute to people's well-being. Uh, so I think the first stage is to say that our goal is to have a well-being economy, not not a growth economy. And, uh, and that implies, on a finite planet, a finite amount of material production and consumption of finite population, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but I think getting that vision across to people, you know, and saying this is a world that would actually be a better world. People would be happier uh, you know, living in, on a planet in a world like that. Um, but uh, I don't think they have that alternative or choice at the moment, but hopefully we can create that back there. Say, use the microphone and... Sorry, uh, I, I saw Peter a while ago. Okay. All right, so you can control the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Kyla. Peter Tate, um, Frank Foundation from here in Canberra. Um, just a small challenging question. Uh, Bob has sort of approached the answer a bit with his scenario, um, planning, but I'm not to talk about that more later. And uh, thank you very much for some really insightful talks. But we continue to talk about the solutions up to the point of we need to do this. But I'm really interested in some input from the speakers about, well, what do we actually need to do practically? What would be a process of transformation? How do we do that transformation rather than just talking about it to each other? Maybe I can start with that and say that the, the, uh, probably the most practical step is creating this alternative vision and sharing it broadly. You know, it may not sound practical to you, you might want, you know, want to do things physically and create infrastructure, but I think actually that is it's much more practical to change the vision and the goal and that the rest of the, uh, the technical aspects uh, will, will follow from that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, one of the main, the main point in sustainable development is uh, consumption, sustainable consumption, but as a society, we are getting more individualistic rather than uh, collectivity. We are getting more individualistic, we want 
everybody want a house and everyone has a car, then probably the sustainable consumption is a bigger question. And uh, if you see as a student as a society, uh, here one of the biggest houses are in Australia, but so we have to think from our individual and family that whether we're going to buy a next house, we're going to buy a smaller house, or whether the parents want to share with the uh, children the house or the children want to share with the, uh, with the parents, that's the main at an individual level. If we can address that, probably sustainable consumption would be a really big. Yes, that's true. Of course, all that sharing is going to make GDP go down. So, <laughs> which needs to be seen as a good thing. And uh, I think the reason Robert Frank had a really interesting book a few years ago called Luxury Fever that uh, makes the point that most of the uh, consumption, or a lot of the consumption in the, in the developed world, is really a, you know, a status arms race. Um, mm -hmm. that you're keeping up with the Joneses. And that doesn't make people better off, you know, as the, the chicken uh, cartoon show. It's just, the, it's just a way of keeping people unhappy uh, because they're not, they're not uh, you know, at the same level as, as their peers. Uh, so that's certainly something that we could change in the steady state of economy. And that's it's only perpetrated, I think, by advertising and by uh, you know, the sort of culture of, uh, of inequality. Uh, but, and to change that, um, you know, if we get back to a culture of and a, and a goal of well-being in the economy, and then obviously the, psych the psychology, there's a whole you know, science of happiness that's involved in um, positive psychology that shows that that's not what makes people happy. You know, what makes people happy is sharing and, and collaborating and be part of the community. And not having all of their own stuff, so that that's a that's one of the real myths I think that, that needs to be you know, overturned. But I think there's a comment there in terms of answering the last two questions. that are really interesting. Uh, to me, they're related and uh, aren't related to I think it was Peter's comment that you know I think it's in the Bible. Um, I'm not religious at all. I'm not even a a lapsed Catholic. I'm completely collapsed. But. <laughs> If the Bible is a lovely phrase, without the vision, there the people perish. And I think that's probably what we're lacking at the moment. I think that, as Bob mentioned, for too long, Greens environmentalists, we've been the teetotaler at the, at the party, you know, directly challenging and, and it made even, the language I use today in my presentation, I would never use uh, with uh, some of my constituents and, and ordinary people, as it were, because it just, A, it's alien to them and it's too challenging and it's seen as hectoring and, and lecturing and so on. Um, but it does seem to me that part of the solution to a different type of economy has to do with a vision based around what I call collaborative consumption. I mean, for me, the image of this is the library. To me, it stands as uh, the most uh, eminently sensible, ecologically rational, social capital producing way in which we can have our needs met for a whole variety of things, tools, um, you know, books, you can borrow um, paintings and so on, but it separates ownership from use. And that to me is the great promise of the, the sharing economy and the importance of moving, in my view, beyond the three Bs which have dominated our economic growth system have been buildings, banks, and boutiques. Certainly, in my own country of Ireland, we had a property speculation which spectacularly collapsed. I mean, the investment, the overinvestment in that particular asset in terms of buildings. Banks, I think, Jennifer has eloquently demonstrated the, the danger of the increasing financialization of our economy. That somehow, it's almost like alchemy. I mean, I'm amazed at the way things like credit default swaps and so on it is, is an echo of a mod of the modern myth you know, brought forward of what alchemists used to do. How can you turn dross into gold? How can a debt, which you slice up in various sorts of ways, pack it up, be sent on to somebody else as an asset? I mean, it's an amazing magical trick that our financial system is able to perpetuate. And the last one then, in terms of boutiques, because I needed, I needed another B, uh, that for me is shorthand for debt-based consumerism. <laughs> So build the facts and boutiques of the model that we have. We need to change those to the three L's. Libraries, laundromats, and library. Which all represent ways in which we can meet our collective needs for mobility, for our clothes being washed, and so on, or having our needs being met in various ways. But they are forms of collective consumption, which to me, you know, is beginning to, 
it appears to me this is the only defensible form of, uh, of, of consumption where you can collectively enjoy uh, in a way we don't have we can separate out ownership from, from use. And that's the debate we need to start having in terms of the issue is not being against uh, people need meeting their needs. The, in, in a modern complex society, we have needs for mobility. But why is it our default position for governments and indeed for parties and so on is a private automobile uh, as opposed to other forms of mobility? So the issue is how do we meet the need for mobility uh, rather than seeing that the default position is private automobiles with all the attendant social health and ecological costs. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Last one. So, thanks. Uh, my name is Bronwyn Morgan from the University in Sydney. I'm just building on the way John has just framed that last point. My question was, where is the question of scale in, in both the existing sort of economic ideology, myth, religion, at the moment, and responses? And just, you know, what you just said, one solution to both mobility and buildings issues that's, that's happened is Uber and Airbnb, and that doesn't, you know, that kind of separation of access and ownership that rapidly grows enormous doesn't seem helpful at all. But there's no conceptual groundwork for talking about scale. Where is the 90, the contemporary small is beautiful debate? I think the whole planetary boundaries uh, issue has, has brought scale back to the, to the forefront and the fact that we, in the, in the climate debate and in many of those issues. So I think it's, it's on the table. It's certainly not on the table in conventional economic thinking, but I think in in, in the real world, <laughs> it's But there's also the issue of scale in terms of, you know, and apparently, as we reflecting on some of the comments we made earlier, is that we, we too quickly just focus on the resource ecological dimension that we're talking about. I mean, I'm interested, yes, certainly they are uh, within limits, um, you know, they are negotiable, but there are limits to them. But, if we focus on the non-ecological aspects here of democracy, that uh, scale becomes really an important issue. You know, selective deglobalization, you know, the deglobalization of our economies becomes more resilient. You know, it seems to me that part and parcel of a decarbonizing energy economy is the importance of these smart grids, which already has an inbuilt almost technical or socio-technical relocalization element to it. So I think that the issue of scale is absolutely central. But I think, yes, certainly the planetary boundaries level, that's, you know, um, a given. But I think if we factor in then these non-ecological dimensions in terms of social inequality, democratization, I think those arguments of Lee Schumacher are still as relevant today as they were back in the 19, you know, 70s and 60s, the small uh, is beautiful. And I think, you know, certainly for me as a sustainability scholar and green activist, it's about questioning globalization. Uh, and arguing for selective deglobalization, the decomplexification of our economy, certainly the decomplexification in relation to what Jennifer was talking about, the financial sector of our economy. And this should not be seen as regressive. I mean, one of the greatest, I think, difficulties I often have in presenting these to, uh, to audiences is the idea that while I'm arguing for somehow a sacrifice, that it's, it's about what people are losing by moving beyond growth. I think we need to start turning the table and say, well, what are we losing now in terms of conviviality, in terms of too big to fail, uh, which has led to all the horrendous impacts we've had over here in Europe in terms of austerity and the failing out of banks that are too big to fail. That there are now compelling ecological circuits, but also non-ecological, democratic, social justice arguments for reducing the scale of our economy and societies around selective, as I say, deglobalization and the relocalization of our economies, which, you know, they're not the complete answer, but I certainly think transition towns, which we send a lot of here in Britain and Ireland, we have, these are experiments of new ways of living that I do think we're going to have to start supporting and researching in the years to come. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. So, thanks <laughs>